Germany is no stranger to scary stories and urban legends. There's the castle that inspired Frankenstein, and it is believed that werewolf tales originated here. The most terrifying urban legends are those that are true, and the scariest monsters are those that are real. In 1929, there was a man who terrorized the German city of Dusseldorf. His lesser crimes over the course of his life culminated in a series of rapes and murders. However, not all rapists and murderers are created equal. Some are much, much more brutal than others, and that's the case here. This man was so depraved that he was described by some as the Dusseldorf monster and the king of sexual perverts, although his most popular nickname was the Vampire of Dusseldorf. This is the story of Peter Kurtan. Peter was born in 1883 to a large dysfunctional family, being one of 13 children. His parents were reported to be poor, abusive, and alcoholics. Having spent a lot of time in Germany, I didn't know it was possible to be an alcoholic there since beer is just part of the staple diet, but maybe that's just in modern times. The entire family resided in a one-bedroom apartment in the town of Mulheim am Rhein. The patriarch of the family was a sadist and a pervert, often forcing the mother to fornicate with the father in front of the children, beating the children if they looked away. In 1894, the father was jailed for 15 months for raping his oldest daughter. While the father was in prison, the mother of the family divorced Peter's father, remarried, and moved to Dusseldorf. She did not take Peter with her, and this would be a mistake that would help foster the evil in Peter. By the age of five, Peter was already starting to show a lack of empathy and violent tendencies. Peter's love for violence was further ingrained into him when he started riding along with a dog catcher that lived in his apartment building. Apparently, German dog catchers of this age tortured and killed the animals that they captured, and Peter loved getting in on the action. Causing pain and death to innocent animals was just a fun way to pass the time for Peter. Peter was the target of much of his father's ire and abuse since he was the oldest son. Strangely enough, Peter was a good student, but this was probably because he was too afraid to go home after school. This academic success did not last long though, as the physical and emotional abuse took its toll on the young Peter. Over time, Peter began running away from home for significant periods of time, and during these episodes, he often ran with other miscreants. During these periods, Peter was becoming a skilled thief. He needed to be in order to feed and clothe himself. At this point, it's hard not to feel sympathetic towards the young Peter. However, rather than not continuing the cycle of pain and despair, Peter decided to go full bore and making the world suffer as he did. At the age of nine, Peter claimed to have committed his first murders. He supposedly pushed a young boy off a wooden raft, knowing the boy couldn't swim. When another boy intervened to save the drowning boy, Peter held both the kids underwater. Both kids ended up drowning, and the local authorities ruled it an accident. Peter's teen years is where things really went downhill fast. Peter managed to get a girlfriend that would engage in some intimacy with him, but would never go to full-blown intercourse. To relieve his desires, Peter first tried to rape his oldest sister, and then started sexually assaulting various barnyard animals, and found he got the most satisfaction from stabbing the animals right as he climaxed. Over time, Peter found out that he could climax simply from stabbing and slashing the defenseless animals. Intercourse wasn't even needed. This is a trait that is very common in most of history's most horrific serial killers. Peter left school for an apprenticeship at the age of 14 and managed to hold things down until the age of 16. At this point, Peter ended up robbing his father and employer, relocating to a town called Koblenz. This lasted a whole four weeks before Peter was arrested and sentenced to a German prison for about a month. Upon his release, Peter continued his life of petty low-level crime just to sustain himself. In November 1899, Peter tried to commit his first recorded murder. He supposedly seduced a young girl at a place called Alestrasa. He took her to a local park where the two had consensual sex. During intercourse, Peter strangled the girl until she lost consciousness. Peter thought he had killed the girl, but she ultimately survived. Peter admitted later in his confession that this was the greatest point of sexual satisfaction for him, and this was a dragon that he had to keep chasing. The details of a small crime spree that Peter engaged in are hazy, but what is known is that Peter was arrested for two counts of fraud, as well as non-fatally shooting a young woman. This resulted in Peter going to prison for four years. Upon his release in the summer of 1904, 
Peter was immediately drafted into the German army, but then later deserted while in the French city of Metz. On his journey back to Dusseldorf, Peter started setting fires to barns and other semi-remote buildings. In his later confession, Peter stated that watching the emergency he created gave him immense sexual pleasure, and he was also hoping to kill a few vagrants in the process by burning them alive. Ultimately, Peter admitted to starting 24 structure fires. As you can imagine, Peter didn't get away with this for long and was again captured by German authorities. He was tried in a military tribunal this time for the desertion, as well as the arsons and several robberies. The verdict was, Peter was going to a military prison in the city of Munster for eight years. Given Peter's disposition, he was often in solitary confinement. Peter later said in his confession that during this period of time, it had the opposite effect of rehabilitating him. He stated that this period made him want to lash out at society and kill masses of people. He described these fantasies as how someone would feel upon picturing a naked woman. He even had wet dreams about these murder fantasies. Upon his, upon his release from the latest stint in prison, Peter did what any sane person would do, and he rushed to the pub for a drink. However, unlike any sane person, he broke into the bar and found a nine-year-old girl asleep in her bed. Upon seeing the child, Peter strangled her and then cut her throat relishing in the sound of her blood pouring onto the floor like an open faucet. During this, Peter achieved sexual satisfaction. To add insult to injury, Peter then went to another local pub the following night to listen to the townsfolk talk about the depravity and horror of the crime he had just committed. The people's disgusted reaction was pure symphony to Peter's ears. Even after the poor girl's funeral, Peter routinely made trips to her grave. When handling the soil, this also gave Peter perverse gratification. A few months later, during another burglary, Peter found another sleeping girl. This time, the unlucky girl was the 17-year-old Gertrude Franken. Peter again strangled her, but this time he used so much force that her esophagus was ruptured and blood started coming out of her mouth. The sight of this blood was all Peter needed to become sexually excited, leading him to climax. He managed to escape both scenes undetected. Sadly, Peter got away with these crimes. A few days after the murder of Franken, Peter was arrested and convicted of several arsons, burglary, and a robbery. He was sent back to a military prison for another eight years stint. This gave Peter plenty of time to relish in the murders he had committed, as well as contemplating ways to improve his technique. The two girls murdered were simply victims of convenience. Once released, Peter wanted to create victims deliberately. When released, which, by the way, how could the German government not see the signs and just bury Peter under the jail at this point? Anyhow, when Peter was released, Peter went to live with one of his sisters in the town of Altenburg. His sister was friends with a woman called Auguste Scharf, who was an ex-prostitute turned candy shop owner. Auguste had previously spent time in a women's prison for shooting her husband to death, so these two seemed like a perfect fit. After a while, Peter and Auguste got married, and even had a seemingly normal relationship, except for the fact that Peter had to visualize violence in order to become aroused. For a while, it seemed like Peter was turning his life around. He even found stable, non-criminal jobs. Peter went to work and came home to the missus, but other than that, he minded his own business and kept to himself. In 1925, the pair moved from Altenburg back to Dusseldorf. The stability didn't last long once they were back in Dusseldorf, though. Peter started several affairs with a servant girl and a housemaid, which was rather brave since his wife was known to put bullets in her lovers in the past. When the affairs were discovered by Auguste, she was rightly pissed and went off a bit unhinged. The two mistresses then reported Peter to the police, one claiming that he had raped her and the other claiming that he was guilty of coercion. The rape charge was dropped, but Peter did another eight months for seduction and threatening behavior. There isn't much info from 1925 until 1929. I can't imagine that Peter didn't just resort back to his normal life of petty crime again, but things really escalated in 1929. Peter had officially lost any remaining threat of sanity that he had. On the 3rd of February, Peter stalked an older woman named Apollonia and eventually dragged her into some bushes where he stabbed her 24 times with what can only be described as a prison weapon, a sharpened pair of scissors. 
He would use these same scissors in most of the following attacks. Some stabs were so deep that the shiv stuck in her bones. However, the woman survived the brutal assault. On the 8th of February, Peter got his hands on another 9-year-old girl that he kidnapped, strangled, sexually assaulted, and then mutilated with his sharpened pair of scissors. He then sexually assaulted the girl's body before hiding her body in a hedgerow. A few hours later, Peter returned to the girl's body with some kerosene and burned her corpse. Peter again became sexually satisfied by watching the flames engulf her. The girl's charred corpse was found the following day. On the 13th of February, Peter mutilated a mechanic called Rudolph by gouging out his eyes, stabbing him through the skull, and once the man's body was discovered, Peter then went on to converse with the police in order to give them false information about the crime and to relish in the panic that he had caused. These three murders had a few things in common. They all happened at dusk or right as it got dark. They all lacked more traditional motives like robbery or revenge, and all three were seemingly random victims. He also later claimed that he was drinking the blood from a few of these victims. This gave investigators a sign that they were dealing with someone truly abnormal, but also very dangerous. Peter confessed that he killed four more women between March and July, but there were no bodies found bearing those wounds that he described, and no missing people reported. His next confirmable murder happened on the 11th of August, when he raped, strangled, and mutilated a woman called Maria Hahn. Peter described Maria as a woman looking for marriage, and he had told her that he wanted to meet up for a romantic date. After a few hours, Peter took Maria to a field and began the very slow process of killing her. While begging for her life, Peter would choke her and non-fatally stab her. After tiring of the struggle, Peter inflicted more serious knife wounds and sat beside Maria, gleefully watching her bleed out. From the start of the attack, it took Maria over an hour to fully succumb to her injuries. Peter then buried the girl's body in a nearby cornfield. Several weeks later, Peter returned to her grave hoping to dig up Maria and crucify her on a nearby tree to shock the people of the city. However, Peter was too weak to complete this act, so he settled for putting her corpse on top of him and romantically kissing and caressing her. After reburying Maria, he returned to the grave several times, getting a macabre satisfaction from knowing what lay beneath the soil. Three months after the murder, Peter sent an anonymous letter to the police to inform them where Maria's body could be found. Maria's remains were eventually found on November 15th. After the murder of Maria, Peter upgraded to a proper knife. This was more to try and throw off the police by making them think more than one killer was on the loose, rather than to be more effective. On the 21st of August, Peter went on a bit of a stabbing spree. In a matter of hours, Peter had stabbed an 18-year-old woman, a 37-year-old woman, and a 30-year-old man. All three had significant injuries, but ultimately survived. When speaking with police, they stated the attacker didn't say anything to them before breaking out in a frenzied knife attack. One of Peter's most revolting attacks was on August 24th, when he attacked two sisters aged 5 and 14. The two girls were walking home from the local fairgrounds when Peter approached them. He managed to convince the older girl to leave by asking her to buy him some cigarettes in exchange for a nice delivery fee. Once the older girl left, Peter lifted up the younger girl by the neck, strangling her until she passed out, where Peter then cut her throat and started drinking blood from the wound. The older sister came back with the cigarettes and stumbled upon this absolute scene of horror. She tried to run, but Peter caught her and drove his knife into her chest once before she wriggled out of his grasp. Sadly, this initial stab pierced her aorta. The girl only made it about 7 meters before she collapsed. Once she was down, Peter bit her on the neck, ripping out chunks of flesh and again drinking from the wounds. He discarded both girls in some thick vegetation and simply strolled away. The next day, Peter had asked a housemaid that lived in his area if she wanted to sleep with him. As any sensible woman who was pretty much asked, are you DTF, the woman said no. How did Peter respond to this rejection? He simply said, well die then, and then began to stab the woman viciously. The maid survived, but sadly couldn't give much information on her attacker besides the fact that he was around 40 years old. Come September, Peter committed two more knife attacks, but he failed to kill both victims 
and it was at this point that he decided to change up his tactics. Peter added a hammer to his arsenal, which still included the knife and the sharpened scissors. On the 30th of September, Peter came across a 31-year-old maid called Ida at the Dusseldorf train station. Peter asked Ida if she wanted to go for a drink in a nearby cafe, and she agreed. After what seemed like a decent date, the two went for a walk in a nearby park. Little did Ida know, she was walking with the devil himself. Once the two were in a secluded location, Peter removed the hammer from his coat and struck Ida several times in the head, knocking her unconscious. Peter then began raping Ida as she was passed out, but she woke up during the act, and this caused Peter to start smashing her repeatedly until he knew she was dead, and then he just kept doing whatever he pleased with her remains. On the 11th of October, Peter found another girl walking alone, and as vampires tend to be, he was charming and convinced her to go for a drink and then a walk along the river. When the girl least expected it, she was struck with Peter's hammer and again knocked out. Peter sexually assaulted the woman's body, and when he was done, hit her a few more times for good measure. Sadly, she died from her injuries, but according to the police that found her the next day, it took about 24 to 48 hours for her to finally die. On October 25th, Peter attacked two women with his hammer, and was interrupted on the first attack by bystanders. On the second attack, he failed because he hit the woman so hard that he broke the hammer. Luckily, both women survived their attacks. People were starting to get pissed about the chaos and terror this absolute degenerate was causing. Public pressure on the police force was mounting. Something had to be done. The final straw for Peter was on the 7th of November, 1929. Peter came across an unaccompanied five-year-old girl called Gertrude, and then he lured her into an area with a bunch of abandoned housing. When the coast was clear, Peter grabbed the girl by the throat, choking her. In the process of strangling the girl, Peter drove the scissors into her left temple, killing the girl almost instantly. Peter described the moment as, quote, She just dropped to the ground without a sound. It was like blowing out a candle. Peter still wasn't satisfied. So he stabbed the girl another 34 times before dumping her body in a pile of nettles. This would be his final murder since the entire city was on edge and investigators were really trying to step their game up. This was Peter's final murder. In the latter part of the summer of 1929, the press had been very enamored with Peter's crimes. His crimes were major news not only in Germany, but internationally. The media dubbed Peter the Vampire of Dusseldorf because of his savagery, the evidence that he was drinking blood, and the bite marks on the necks of several victims. Given the inconsistency in the profile of the victims, lack of traditional motives, and various methods of attack, the police thought they were looking for multiple suspects, which slowed the investigation. People were rightly pissed off, and over 13,000 letters were sent to the police to tell them to get off their asses and catch this killer. Every lead was followed up on, 9,000 people were interviewed, and 2,600 clues were investigated, and there were almost a million names on the list of suspects. Peter also had a habit of sending taunting letters to the media and police. This would ultimately contribute to his downfall. The police were thinking that they were looking for several people, but after intense handwriting analysis, professionals determined that the same person wrote every letter, including the map that led to Maria Hahn's body. Now the police could narrow down to one person, rather than thinking that they were looking for a myriad of killers. Between February and May 1930, Peter had attacked another 10 people with his hammer, but they all survived, and many were able to give a good description to Peter. Peter's undoing would rest on the shoulders of a woman called Maria Budlick. Budlick was new to the area, looking for employment and lodging, so a strange man offered to walk her to a local hostel to which she agreed. The unknown man tried to lure her to a secluded area, and Budlick protested. The two began to argue, and a bystander asked Budlick if she was in need of some help. Budlick said yes, and the man ran off. Unfortunately, the man that came to her aid was the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Budlick was rightfully distressed, so Peter invited her to his apartment. She went, but she knew he was just trying to get sex out of her. She decided to leave soon after arriving at Peter's apartment, so Peter agreed to show her to a hostel like the previous man. Also like the previous man, he led her to some secluded woods where he tried to strangle and rape her. She was screaming and fighting so hard that Peter ended up fleeing the scene. Budlick never reported the attack, but she did write about it to a friend. 
The letter was not correctly addressed, so it was opened and read by a post office employee. The employee forwarded the letter to police, and police tracked down Budlick. During the interview with police, Budlick recounted to the police where Peter lived, and the landlady told police that the tenant's name was Peter Curtin. The jig was up. Peter was coming home as the police were leaving his apartment, so he knew it was only a matter of time before he got caught. He tried to hide for a while, but it was taking its toll on him. He told his wife that he was the vampire of Dusseldorf, and that she should turn him in to collect the substantial reward being offered for his capture. The next day, Augusti contacted the police to tell them that Peter was the vampire of Dusseldorf and that he was ready to turn himself in. Peter was to meet police outside of a local church, and he was arrested at gunpoint without incident. Once in police custody, Peter freely admitted to all of his crimes, as well as some extras the police didn't have tied to the vampire of Dusseldorf. Peter admitted to a total of 10 murders and 31 attempted murders. However, Peter was explicit in denying that he tortured his child victims. During interrogations, Peter said that just the sight of the victim's blood was the greatest sexual satisfaction. After reaching climax, Peter would often become apologetic to his victims and is quoted as saying, that is what love is all about, to the investigators. When asked about the drinking of blood, he said he drank the blood of three victims and even cut a head off the swan to feast on the blood. Peter said that he drank so much blood from Maria Hahn that he ended up vomiting. During the trial, Peter claimed that his actions were the result of him lashing out at society for the periods of being incarcerated. The initial plea was not guilty on the basis of insanity, but once it was determined that his wife would lose the reward money, he changed the plea to guilty. The jury was given his confession, Peter openly admitted to the who, what, and why of his crime spree. Peter relished in his crimes, but he did show remorse for one thing, his wife. He stated he was sorry for being unfaithful to a woman that was nothing but good and loyal to him. His sole reason for confessing to her was to make sure that she would be financially comfortable in her old age. This was one of the only noble and selfless acts Peter ever committed. On the 22nd of April, Peter was sentenced to death by the jury. He was still owning up to everything and made no excuses for his crimes. On the 1st of July, 1931, Peter ate his last meal, wrote a goodbye letter to Augusti, and on the morning of the 2nd, Peter was walked out to the platform in the prison to see the guillotine that would take his life. Shortly before he placed his head on the guillotine, Peter turned to the psychiatrist and asked the question, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, Will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasure. When asked if he had any last words, Peter simply smiled and replied, no. And that's the end of the story of the Vampire of Dusseldorf. Despite all the fiction surrounding blood-sucking undead monsters, this is a true tale of a real monster. He didn't have to have a wooden stake run through his heart, but it probably couldn't have hurt to try that too. Peter felt no remorse for his crimes, and ultimately got off light considering how much suffering he had caused. The only person he really showed any consideration to was his wife, and he ultimately got what he deserved. The city of Dusseldorf was finally free of the clutches of the vampire. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm not going to ask if you liked that video, but if you found it interesting, please consider subscribing for more. I finally finished moving, so I'm going to go back to try to make weekly videos, and I will see you guys next time.